Good Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com Blue Water Climate Control Podcast. Glad to have you along with us on this Tuesday morning with Austin Price and Rob Lewis. I'm Brent Hubbs. Plenty to get to in the podcast. Again, brought to you by our friends at Blue Water Climate Control. Check them out online at BlueWaterClimateControl.com or you can give them a buzz at 865-299-2290 and schedule an appointment. How about scheduling a spring uh, heating and air tune-up from Blue Water Climate Control? If you do that between now and the spring game, which is coming up, you're going to be entered into that drawing to win two season passes. That's two season tickets to all the Tennessee home games. Refer a friend and increase your chances to win. Drawing is going to be held on April the 26th. And then don't forget for VolQuest listeners, um, because of all the referrals you guys have given to Blue Water Climate Control, they want to take care of you. So give them a buzz and find out what they will do for you in terms of uh, repairs and service and the discounts you can get as a part of VolQuest.com. For more on that, uh, give them a call at 865-299-2290. Get, a th- get whatever your problem is taken care of the right way by our friends at Blue Water Climate Control. Plenty to get to in this podcast. Let's start first with some football. I had an opportunity to see Tennessee in a practice uh, on Saturday. I know we talked about it in the mini podcast um, after the game, after the workout on Saturday. Rob, you've had a couple of days to digest it and, and to look at it. Um, at, with t- two weeks to go in spring practice, what, what do you think this team is? What do you think the, the focus for Josh Heupel and his staff is to finish out spring? I, mean, I, I think it's got to be finding a quarterback on that side of the ball. And, and defensively, I mean, I, I I know we were all pretty down on them the other day, but I mean, when you think about it, they they were missing three guys who they were going to be counting on in the front seven, and Tyler Barron, um, Roman Harrison, and oh, I'm drawing a blank over who's the third, Jeremy Banks. Yeah, Jeremy Banks. So I mean, those are, I mean, those, those could be three starters, and I mean, I I think you have to take that into account. Now, with that with that said. You know, I, I don't know how much that has to do with, you know, some of the success they had. But but for me, it's, you know, it starts at quarterback because I, I think we all agree they're going to have to outscore people. So I, I, th- I don't know that you have to leave spring with a starter, but I, I think you want to leave spring with a pretty good idea of, you know, what your depth chart is going to look there. And and lastly, I just want to mention, I, I applaud Coach Heupel for doing that. I mean, it was, you, you know, I, I think that was a savvy move on his part. And I, I think, you know, juxtaposing that with Jeremy Pruitt, I think if you know Jeremy had been a little more open, then he might have been able to manage some expectations better last year. I mean, we might have had an idea that hey, this this ain't this ain't a top twenty five football team. Now, I don't know that you know that, that would have you know that wouldn't have made a difference when you go three and seven. But I at, at least you know the media could have you know maybe changed the narrative a little bit if you know we're seeing the fact that Jared Guarantano is still making the same mistakes he was making as a sophomore. It's a good, well, it's a good, I mean, good point. I was gonna say, good question. I, I was just going to say in defense of Coach Pruitt, I mean, I think that, you know, last fall it would have been harder to um, have an open practice. Yeah, because, last year, you know, man. you know, just because, you know, all that, that had went on with, with the pandemic. And That's, it's a lot easier to get stuff down now than it was six, seven months ago. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. But I, I do think, one, it's a smart move by Josh Heupel to let everybody see it firsthand. I, I think probably the, the one area where I, I think that Heupel's done this, the smartest thing he's done uh, is the, the fact that he's let his assistant coaches talk. Um, because I do think you get a better idea from, from things from, from that standpoint. And uh, so, I, I mean, I, I think that is a um, – I think that's been a good move. And we'll, we'll hear from two assistant coaches – later today in, in the offensive and defensive line with Glenn Ellerby and Rodney Garner. And then on Thursday, uh, Mike Eckler is supposed to talk. And I think that's been a solid move. And we'll see how much he lets him talk during the season. But this spring, I think it's been a smart uh, smart thing for, for Josh Heupel to, to do. Uh, you know, Austin, I, I thought about it on, on Sunday and, and even on Monday some, kind of reviewing and, and looking back through some notes and stuff on, on the practice on, on Saturday. I think Rob makes a good point about the defense. I think you make a really good point about the defense. They kind of are what they're going to be. But how much better do you think they're going to be in the secondary? But because I, I came away from I came away from Saturday thinking, well, maybe it's quarterback. And then I came away thinking, you know what? Maybe they're a little better in the secondary than, than I think that they're going to be. But what, what, do you, what do you make of them back there? And how much can they survive on defense if they're secondary? 
um, is, is an upgrade from where they were a year ago. No, I don't know. I, I don't think anybody's really going to know a whole lot um, except for, you know, you know, you, you might hear that the offense had a nice day or the defense had a nice day, but I don't think you're really going to truly know until they line up play against somebody else, Brent. Sure. Um, you know, uh, the secondary has the potential to be more solid than it was a year ago. Um, you know, and I, you know, Rob, Rob brought this point up, and of course, I said, you know, Saturday after the game, you know, you're you're going to get some guys back. Now, does that mean that you're all of a sudden going to, you know, be a lot better on defense? Probably not. But at the same time, I do think that, you know, uh, it drives home the point that Tennessee's first team or, you know, a little bit past the first 11 could be solid across the board, but they just not going to have a whole lot of depth. And, and, and so injuries, in my opinion, could, you know, be the determining factor on how many games Tennessee wins or doesn't win this fall, because if you miss – the right guy for a substantial amount of games, it, it could affect Tennessee's winning loss column easily. Yeah. I, I, I was just going to say, I mean, if he turns into what everybody kind of thought he was going to be, that's losing Keyshawn Lawrence is a huge loss. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I just kind of like McDonald a little bit. I, I did not see much out of Danico Slaughter. I don't even know if he even scrimmaged or, or practiced on Saturday. I just, it, it, he was not a guy that, that stood out to me if he was out there, but McDonald's, you know, stood out. I thought Warren Burrell made a couple of plays. I, I just, I like Willie Martinez as a coach. I think Willie Martinez has done it for a long time in this league. And I, I think he's pretty solid a, as a coach. I mean, I think this is a defense that's going to be, uh, I think we all agree that they're going to be a, a bend, but, but don't break type defense, you know, see if let teams drive it in the middle of the field and hold them to some field goals and try to outscore. I mean, I think it's a little bit of a, a bit of an NFL mentality in, in terms of how you, you play defense. I, I think that's how Tennessee is going to have to survive. They're going to give up yards. The question is, can they win in the red zone? I think, Austin, you mentioned this on the podcast. Can you win in the red zone and limit, you know, touchdowns and, and make them kick field goals? If you do, then you're going to give yourself a chance uh, to, to, to be a, a bowl-eligible team if the NCAA hasn't made a ruling or wherever you are with that situation. But you have a chance to win six or seven football games. If you can't stop people in the red zone, then – it's going to be a long year because you're going to have to win 48 to 45. And that's very hard to do um, week in and week out, to, you know, in, in the SEC. I don't think that there's any doubt about that. We all know they've got to have quarterback play. They've got to, I mean, that's, that's the number one given. The quarterback play has to be better. When you look from a transfer standpoint, everybody talks about transfer portals and who knows where they go with the quarterback or not go with the quarterback. Is getting a linebacker transfer the most important thing for this football team? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, you know, I, I don't think they really need help on the offensive side of the ball unless you say they need a tackle. If you could get a tackle that's got experience that you know can help you, I think offensive tackle would be another position on offense. Um, you know, I, we talked about, you know, at least they've had conversations with Tommy Bush. And, you know, who knows, maybe they do take him. I just don't see it. I, I would lean into them not at this point you know even if he just based off the I think receiver position than they did before spring practice and then offensive side and I do think that linebacker would be the one spot where you feel like you know if you could get a guy that has experience and has talent enough to get on the field then you take him I just think Robin that you got to have a linebacker I, I just think that you're just looking at the bodies there even if you know, even getting banks. I mean, Roman Harrison's got talent, but but he hasn't played that position. Um, I think he's better suited inside than he is to be a defensive end. I just think you've got to take a, a body there. I just don't think yeah, you I mean, have when enough you bodies. See, when you have one, you know, one or two injuries, and then you got walk-ons in the two deep. I mean, that's that tells you all you need to know. Yeah, I, I just think that that's going to be difficult. Um, Austin, do we see the suspended players anytime between now and the end of spring practice? Uh, I thought we would, Brent. Uh, I thought we would see Caden Salter coming up uh, this afternoon. I don't, I'm not sure that's going to be the case. So, you know, can he get back out there and, you know, basically go, you know, get acclimated late in the week and then be able to be in pads all of next week? We'll see. I mean, like, 
it's been a slow process process up to this point. So, you know, nothing, nothing about it makes me feel like that they're just uh, jumping to get them back out there. And even if they get them back out there, can they get much out of them? I mean, you're talking about a week and a half. Is it, I mean, cause they got to go through an acclimation period. Is, is it, I'm not saying you shelf them. I'm not, I mean, you got to get them out there if you can get them out there, but boy, that they, they're just, they've missed out on a golden opportunity to show themselves that, that anything this spring, not just Salter, but Isaac Washington and all these guys, it's just, it's really kind of been just a throw. I mean, it has been a throwaway spring for those guys, you know, and it's their fault, oh. but still, I just, even if you get them back, I just don't know that you're going to get a whole lot out of them at this point. You, you, you would have been better served to go back and finish the last semester of high school, go to prom, go hang out with your buddies. Cause you're right. Every bit of this was wasted. I mean, you know, maybe if you get in three practices next week, it won't, it won't be a total waste, but even then like, What's the retention going to be for any of these kids when they're out there for just a couple of days, you know, between now and, and August? I just, they, they, they all missed a golden opportunity, especially with how thin they are at linebacker. A guy like Aaron Willis could have, you know, got plenty of run this spring. <laughs> you know, I mean, like Isaac Washington, uh, you know, Tennessee's looking for more defensive linemen, and Rodney Garner's looking for more explosive defensive linemen. And then, of course, Caden Salter, I mean, you know, whether he was going to have a chance to be the starter or not, who knows. But, you know, just to get, you know, these 15 practices in would have at least given you a chance heading into fall camp. And now, you know, his ability to, to, to play this fall seems few and far between, at least early. All right. So, Rob, you got uh, two weeks of practice left. You're Josh Heupel. You've seen, uh, you, you've seen what you have at this point. What's your priority to finish to the finish line here? I know quarterbacks are given, but what maybe outside of quarterback? What's your priority to finish this thing? I mean, I, I, I guess you have kind of this would be a priority, but I mean, just finding out what you've got. I mean, offensive line. What do you you know? What's your what's your best five look like? I mean, what are you rolling the fall camp with? I mean, we saw a couple of different combinations the other day with Cade moving around, <clears throat> different guys at center, um, and, and same thing on the defensive side of the ball. What? You know, who can play? What You know, who who is a legit SEC guy in your two deep on defense, especially in that in that back seven? Because, I Austin, you touched on the depth a minute ago in the secondary, and, you know, we all know how stressed the depth is at linebacker right now with Harrison and Banks out. And, and the fact that you're talking about how bad Tennessee's hurt by Harrison and Banks being out, I mean, just highlights – the problems they have at linebacker because those aren't those aren't two, two guys that have played a ton of football. You know, Harrison's in a new position, and you know Banks has been there, but it's not like he's just got a ton of snaps, and yet they're out and the position's crippled. Yeah, I mean it is one hundred percent, and so um, uh, you know I think it will be fascinating to see what happens here uh, the last week and a half if they can get really anything of note done or. or if it's just kind of, hey, this is who we are, who we are. I mean, Saturday, Austin feels like it's kind of the big day, um, that final major scrimmage. No offense to the spring game, but it feels like Saturday's kind of the big deal and, and kind of the real last chance for some guys to really make a splash and, and leave a big-time impression. So we'll see what they get done in the two practices leading up to Saturday, and then we'll see what they can, can accomplish on Saturday. Um, let, let's hop over to hoops right quick, and then we'll, we'll close it out with a little bit of football recruiting. Uh, Rob, on the hoops front, Rick Barnes currently has a full staff. We don't think there's going to be any more movement of note on the staff at, the, at this point. Maybe. We'll see. One possibility. There, there's rumblings that East Carolina could come open. Uh, don't know if that will happen, but if it does, I would expect Mike Schwartz to be a major candidate. John Gilbert obviously is there was here at Tennessee, has a really good idea of, of, you know, what Coach Schwartz is about. So, again, there, there's a buyout situation. Allegedly, the story I've gotten is that the, the guy there now is wanting to leave to go to Kansas as an assistant. He's willing to step backwards. But, you know, they're not going to let him go for free. I don't think he's going to pay his own buyout just to be an assistant coach. But just keep that one in the back of your mind. If there is movement there, Mike Schwartz will be becomes a candidate. Wow, that's a strong candidate. That would be a tough – to me, that would be a pretty tough loss for Rick Barnes. I think right? it would be a brutal loss. You know, for, in terms of what Schwartz – I mean, Schwartz is a good recruiter, but what he does on the field, on the court 
I mean, Rick Barnes has a ton of confidence in, in my I mean, sport. He, he's the guy that draws your Kentucky scout, that draws your Alabama scout. I mean, it's, you know, Rick juggles those things around. But when, when the heavy hitters come to town, when Kansas come, came to town, that was a Mike Schwartz scout. And he Rick leans heavily on him, has a ton of faith in him, ton of trust. Uh, that would be a big loss. All right. So you broke the story on, on Ganey. Um, did I say that right? Yeah, Justin Ganey. Justin Ganey. Um, and, and you broke that story on Saturday. What, what do you like about that hire? What do you know about that? By the way, had a chance to visit, spend some time with Rod Clark on Monday night uh, at Vol Calls. And um, I understand why, why he's got the ability to recruit. Uh, really bright, really sharp guy. I know he's a young guy, but really, really sharp. But, but, but what do you think of Justin Ganey? What do you know about him? I like to hire because it fills a lot of the boxes recruiting wise that you lost with Des Oliver. I mean, he's, he played at NC state. He has lots of ties in the Carolinas. Obviously Des, you know, uncovered Grant Williams and Charlotte brought Jaden Springer, you know, he played at IMG, but he was originally from Charlotte and um, he's got, he just has a lot of ties to the recruiting areas that you, you lost touch with when Des left. So from that standpoint, I think it's, a, I think it's a really nice, fit also you know, he's not 50 plus but he's an older guy in, in his 40s um mature and i think rick really likes that mix he really wanted a young guy like he got with clark because of the experience they had with english he liked kind of the, the juice that, that kim brought to the program and so he checked that box and now he wanted an experienced guy a guy who has a reputation as a recruiter um and a guy who is familiar with the territories where Tennessee is, has got to recruit regionally to be successful. All right. So let's, um, let's talk about transfers. Cause in the Monday night chat, that was basketball hoops transfers seemed to dominate a lot of that conversation, but where, where does things stand? Right. First of all, anything new on John Fulkerson, let's just check. This is uh, changes all the time. My last, the last time I p- talked with someone to kind of, you know, try to take the pulse of that one, they felt like Folky was coming back, but, Again, that one, I hear different things different weeks. I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense for him to come back unless he just wants to get on with life. I mean, he could play in the G League, but you're not making any money there. I mean, he could play overseas, but he's not going to be one, a guy that gets one of those, you know, big, fat Chris Lofton overseas contracts. So, and, and you know, to me, it just makes a lot of sense. But, again, he, no, no decision yet. He better be back, Rob. That's all I got to say. <laughs> you better be back, especially after Anastasia went to the portal. That, that controls chance. whether that, that controls whether you go to the golf course or not. All right, all right, Rob. So we think transfer wise, Tennessee's probably done. I, I mean, I, and, I, and, and unless, let me say, let me let me say, let me rephrase that. Done in terms of losing players. Okay, let me let me let me say. Yeah, that. I mean, I've heard a couple of rumblings, and I would never say never in in today's climate. But I would I would be surprised. That's not to say that it's impossible. All right, let's let's talk. Surprised. Let's talk about who's out there available for Tennessee. What what do you see on that front? Right now, the guys are available. I know Tennessee would love to get Garrison Brooks, the guy who's leaving UNC. They've reached out to gauge interest. I don't I don't feel like they have a ton of confidence. That, that, I mean, they could be players. I mean, he may express some interest, but I, I've heard a um, couple of people who think he will go elsewhere. Of the guys who are out there right now. You know, I'm just not. I'm, I'm just not sure that Tennessee is either in love with anybody or in deep with anybody like Brooks. Now there are a couple guys that have not hit the portal, like Tyreek Key, who is at Indiana State. He's originally from Clay County, Tennessee. Really good guard. Um, if he he you know, there's been rumblings about him hitting the portal. He has not done so yet. Uh, Tennessee would be involved there, and some, a guy that a lot of people have talked about on the board, Dante and Folly at Oregon, who. Tennessee has some some really serious ties with, with Rod Clark, who we were just talking about a minute ago. And Folly played at Sunrise Christian, where he was an assistant coach. He played for Mocan Elite, which was the grassroots Nike program that, that Clark got his start with. So Tennessee would be majorly involved there, but, you know, he hasn't hit the portal. There's been some, some buzz out there that he will. I, I don't know if that's going to happen, but if he does, that would certainly be one to watch. The one to watch is, is not a transfer, but it's Joseph, or excuse me, Jonas Idu, and I may be pronouncing that wrong. A I D O O, kid from he's he's from Charlotte, played at Durham this past year. He was a Marquette commit. Justin Ganey got him up there, and you know he 
with the coaching change, he decommitted. He's out there. I think that one's strictly down to Tennessee and UNC. It's going to depend on what wins out, his relationship with, with Ganey or the desire of a kid that grew up in Charlotte to play for, you know, one of the most legendary programs in the sport that is also his home, his home state team. And that's, you know, North Carolina did not recruit, did not recruit him until they had two guys going to the portal. Right. I mean, it, it, he was, I mean, he went to Marquette yeah, because, change. because yeah. And the coaching change, because um, North Carolina didn't, he didn't pick Marquette over North Carolina, no. you know, no. he did not have that North Carolina option. So that obviously changes things. Uh, dramatically there but before we go into football recruiting I, I want to ask this as a, as a transfer portal question to both of you guys I, I saw this earlier in the week on Twitter or somewhere Matt Painter from Purdue has, has kind of thrown this out as an idea he's not brought it before a committee or anything he has concerns about the transfer portal his thing is that no one should be able to enter the transfer portal until they've been at a school for two years Give it two years. And then you can, tra after two years, if you want to transfer, you can transfer anywhere and be eligible immediately. But his concern is that, you know, you're, you're just having to re-recruit a guy every year and, and, and you can't, you can't de-recruit him and really break him into your program and get him acclimated to your program because three months into town, he's ready to leave. He's mad about this, that, or the other. Your thoughts on any tweaks potentially to the transfer portal. Is that a crazy idea? Is, is that, do you think there are some tweaks to the transfer portal that's going to need to take place based on how we're seeing the transfer portal in football and college basketball go right now? I don't think Painter's rule is tenable because what, what if a coach – I mean, we all know it. AP, you know it. Hubbard, you know it. I mean, how many times does a coach want to run a kid off after one year? I mean, they're not wanting – I mean, you're going to hang – coaches aren't, wanting to be, aren't going to want to be handcuffed that way. Like, if a kid comes in and he is totally not a fit, if he's a cancer – you know, and you've got to keep him around for another year on scholarship in your locker room. I mean, coaches would hate that. I, for me, I think a better one would be, other than, than a grad transfer, you, you can't transfer after your freshman year, other than a coach, other than if there's a coaching change. So you're saying you, you one year, if you, if you feel like after a year it doesn't fit for you, then, then you, you can, can leave. Pull. But after your junior year, your sophomore, let's say after your sophomore year, you can't bolt because you're not a graduate. But unless, you you're a graduate. unless there's a coaching change. Or you could bolt, but sit and, out a year. Wow. That's an interesting thought. Austin Price, you got any thoughts on transfers? Well, uh, my thing is, is like to, to, to piggyback Painter's thoughts, were the fact that like okay like Tennessee right now is in this weird spot where like you know if they move Lenneth Whitehead to linebacker or move player X to another position and the kid's not on board and kids are just going to bounce you know so I mean I, I think that the one-time transfer has put all of the power in the student athletes hands um which, I mean, I, I like to a degree, but at the same time, like, I think kids will, you know, it's going to create such a uh, – it's going to create so much consternation with, you know, the bouncing around. And, I mean, look how many kids are currently in the portal that don't have homes. I mean, it's just it, – it's the thing to do. So, I do think you want to tweak it in some form or fashion, whether it's going with Rob's route or going with Matt Painter's route. Um, I, I think you have to have some type of – you know, standards on it. Cause I don't think you, if you just, you know, if it's just kind of blank slate and, you know, you know, there's no parameters, I think that that's, that's setting yourselves up for, you know, a, a lot of nonsense. I, I think that, that, that there's need to be some type of parameters, whether it's two years or, you know, what Rob said, you know, actually makes some sense. Cause I mean, how much of that is, is you get to a school, especially the next couple of years where you've not had, you know, visits and, and not being able to see you know coaches face to face how many kids are going to get on the campus and go you know i like that guy a lot better on zoom than i did in person i mean i just think that that's a, it's a real possibility across college sports in general the next you know um you know 12 to 24 months um with with the, with the last couple of classes so I think you got to have some type of parameter. There were, there, I mean, this, I don't think this is just division one and I'm, this is kind of some 
I should probably research it a little better, but I, I just ran across this this tweet that there were over 2,000 kids in the basketball transfer portal. I, I imagine that has to incorporate, you know, D2 as, as well, because one of the 317 D1 like basketball yeah. skills. So that would be – so that sounds that sounds a little high to me. But I guess that – even if it does include Division two as well, that's – that's an exorbitant amount of kids. Yeah, I I, I think at, at least at a bare minimum that you have to put in a transfer window, a time period. This idea that you can just go into the transfer portal anytime you want to and essentially stay in it for months and, and can pull yourself out if you want to, can go back in. I mean, I think you got to put a window in there, almost like a free agency window in the NFL where you say, okay, you can go in the portal at this time you know, um, whether it's April one for basketball or whenever, but, but you, you know, your, your window to decide is 30 days in April or, or April. Like, May the, like, the, or like the NFL draft or NBA draft where you have to declare by a certain date. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think you got to put it at, at least some kind of perimeter on that and said, you know, that you have a guy in, a, in he can be in the transfer portal his whole season essentially and still be a part, you know, and, and participate around. That's just, to me, that's really odd, but we'll see what their what their tweaks are or they aren't at this point. I know that there's a growing concern because of the numbers that you're talking about, Rob, and just how high they are and how many guys are going to end up not having places to play who thought they were going to have, you know, all these guys think that, you know, they're going to land on, you know, whatever Power 5 team they want. That's just not realistic. That's why there's a lot of kids without homes right now who are sitting in the transfer portal. Um, trying to figure out what they're going to do next. Are they going to try to go back to where they're at or, uh, or is a coach going to not let them back or, or whatever? I, I think that you're going to have to tweak it a little bit to slow things down. All right, let's hop into football recruiting right quick here, Austin, as we get ready to wrap it up. Um, obviously, a lot of focus on the, the Wade twins coming up on Friday. Um, seems like anybody's guess. Seems like both the, those two kids are, are going to both talk to Tennessee and Kentucky all the way to the finish line on this thing. Well, and <laughs> you've seen every team that's basically recruiting them has offered the Brady Pierce kid, who is their teammate and their really good friend, the preferred walk-on spot. Kentucky, Tennessee, then you saw Ole Miss do it. Now Virginia has done it. Um, just kind of funny, just, you know, the kind of <laughs> the dominoes and the kind of the, the little things going on behind the scenes as uh, teams try to, uh, to land with those kids. You know, I – Tennessee's had really lengthy conversations, Brent, the last, you know, several days uh, with with all the family, whether it be mom or the boys, um, you know, and, and they're putting a lot of time into Tennessee. And that leads me to believe that, one, either Tennessee's in a, in a good spot or they've still not decided. And so they are, you know, doing their due diligence. Um, you know, I, I know Kentucky feels confident. Um, and talking to some people up there. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, I think that, you know, until you get to Friday, nobody, nobody really knows. And so, um, you know, I, I just kind of reading tea leaves is kind of how I'm kind of, I know I put in the chat, you know, I still lean Tennessee just based off of the tea leaves. That doesn't mean the tea leaves are correct, but I just am reading the tea leaves. Um, that's just kind of how I see it at this point. All right, AP, what else is going on out there in recruiting? Well, you know, Tennessee, uh, you know, still you know, tr still looking for their first commitment of the Josh Heupel era. Um, Elijah Herring, if, if, the, if the twins aren't the first, then I think Elijah Herring will be, um, you know, and that should happen sometime in the not-so-distant future. Um, you know, we've, we've been hinting at that one pretty hard for the last several weeks, and uh, – you know, Tennessee, I think, is in a really good spot for Taven Jackson. Um, I think they're in a really good spot for a guy like Cam Miller, you know, even though I think it's, it's going to boil down to how well Cam camps at Alabama in June. If if Alabama goes in a different direction of receiver, then I think Tennessee, um, you know, will, will likely be the choice there for a guy like Cam Miller. So, you know, I, things are starting to kind of, the dots are starting to connect a little bit. And I think depending on the decision of the Wade twins, everything kind of falls in place a little bit easier after that. If those kids pick Tennessee, if they don't, then I think obviously, you know, it's another, 
kind of speed bump for Josh Heupel and the staff, and uh, they'll have to figure some things out. Well, it's going to be wild for not just this week, but everybody is lining up for June. You're starting to already see it. You're starting to see kids tweet out about official visits and kids are trying to figure out, you know, what camps they're going to go to and, and uh, what visits they're going to take and how quick they're going to line them up. And so um, June is going to be absolutely insane and, and how quickly you can get organized and get everything ready to, to lay out the month of June. I think if you're a, if you're any school, not just Tennessee, but any school around the country, you better have, you better have your ducks in a row pretty quick uh, in terms of what your dates are going to look like and what you're going to try to do in the month of June because slots for kids going places are going to fill up really, really fast because everyone is going to be on the road in the month of June after having not been out in, in over a year. Everybody's going to be somewhere. And so you, you're going to, you, you better get on the horse with that one because you don't want to be late to the party to try to get any of those guys on campus. Uh, that you really want on campus to evaluate either in a camp setting or just in a regular visit because I just, do we, it's going to be crazy. Do we have a feeling on camps yet? I think they're going to open. I think they're going to open them up. I mean, I, 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 to June some degree, July, maybe July, maybe pushing back to July. I think it's going to be in June. I think they're going to. I think they're going to relax the dead period in June, and I think they're going to. Right now, it feels like to me, and maybe Austin, you've heard different. Feels like to me, they're going to turn June back wide open like a normal year. Yeah. It's wide open, and and, and camps uh, across um, all sports will, will take place in June. I think that's going to be fascinating because you just know there are going to be kids that people don't know of, or kids that are you know maybe they know of but are lower rated, and kids that are you know five star top one hundred guy. You're going to see this some dramatic movement. I think in you know who schools are targeting, where guys are ranked. Once they get looked at, you know, for kids that haven't been to a camp since after their freshman season. Oh, I think oh, it's going to be crazy. I, I, think there are, I think there are a ton of kids, um, and I know we're up against time-wise, but I, there are a ton of kids across college football that I think are are resting on the fact that they got a ton of offers as freshmen and sophomores before the dead period hit and there was no camps. And then I, I think when they go camp, they may take a hit, so they may be best served to not go camp. Whereas there are some kids out there that, you know, have kind of been hidden. There were no camps. Nobody knows anything about them. And then when they camp, they're going to go boom. So, like, I think it's going to be going both directions. I think some guys no, are, 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 are higher ranked that probably shouldn't be. And then there are some guys that don't have much of a ranking that will end up ascending pretty quick. Yeah, Because I mean, we're basically talking about I mean, how much do kids change from the time they're 15 years old to the time they're 17 years old. Well, I got one in my house that's in that age bracket, and I can tell you this, it's dramatic. I mean, it, on a lot of fronts, you know, physically, mentally, it's it's a dramatic change. There's a, there's a whole difference during that time, and I think that's what a lot of college coaches want to see, and I think a lot of kids are trying to figure out, hey, where do I want to visit, and um, every college coach is, is telling every kid, hey, you're going to have to come see us. You know, you got to come visit, so some tough decisions are going to have to be made. Who wins out in the month of June in terms of getting guys on campus? How successful is Tennessee at that? Will be beneficial not just and will be big not just for the 22 class, but for for trying to assemble the 23 and 24 class as well. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Blue Water Climate Control Volquets.com podcast for Austin Price and Rob Lewis. I'm Brent Hubs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, everybody.